Good morning, friends, and welcome to Gardening with Creekside. Today we have a fun project. Very excited about this. The planting of annuals continues because it is definitely go time here in North Carolina, a zone 8A where I am. We are going to plant three different hay racks, window boxes, wall hangings, a little bit of, uh, of everything here uh, in our shade garden right along our driveway. Of course, there's the driveway. Now, when we're doing this video, you're gonna be, Jenny, you're in the sun. Well, it is um, eight o'clock in the morning. So this spot gets four hours or less of morning sun, and then it's in the shade for the rest of the day. Therefore, this is a shade garden. It will be sunny today when we're filming, uh, but just know that this definitely is a shade garden. Got some fun, fun plants that we are gonna put in here. Of course, if you have been following us, you know that this is going to be a very full summer for us here at Creekside because we are hosting a wedding at the end of May. And then almost one month later, we have our signature experience where we are welcoming 50 guests to come here um, and have an intimate experience at Creekside Nursery. Part of that is that they get to have self-guided tours here at the house in the evening. I'm going to have lots of people up close and personal in my gardens um, multiple times this year, not just showing you on video. So I want things to look mwah, just delicious and wonderful and just very inspiring and beautiful. First of all, let's look at the plants that we're going to put in. Okay, so I've got Johnny here, of course, and I have my selection of shade loving or shade tolerant plants. My One of my main colors in my shade garden for my annuals this year is going to be the Rocapuco purple. If you have followed us for any length of time, you know that I adore the Rocapuco impatience. This is of course a part shade to shade plant. They're gonna get anywhere from 10 to 20 inches tall. In a container, they're going to be a little bit smaller. So they're gonna be more in that 10, 12, 14 inch range. When we put them in the landscape, then therefore they go more towards that 20 um, height on that. This it definitely is a shade plant. It can handle the morning sun, but it does not like the intense hot afternoon sun. I've used tons of different colors. This year I went with purple because it is um, kind of moody, but yet electric and very happy all at the same time. Not sure how many I need. I just grabbed two trays. I would rather, I'm not gonna use two trays, but I would rather have one too many plants than one not enough. So we have the Rocapucos. I am going to put these also in the landscape, in the shade gardens um, later on in the season once I know how my perennials are filling out. So we'll have a continuous color of the same plant in the containers and in the landscape. That way it transitions and it all blends in really nicely together. I'm also going to use my uh, beloved Diamond Frost. Now Diamond Frost is of course part of that diamond series of euphorbias. Frost is going to be uh, 12 to 18 inches tall. Again, when you're looking at the tag, that 12 inches is gonna be more in a container, the 18 inches is gonna be more in the landscape, simply because it has more room for the roots to grow. Diamond Frost is lovely because it gets very light and airy. It will come up, the Diamond Frost, the Rocapucos will intermingle with one another, gives a very soft, romantic look. Now you might notice on the tag, it says full to part sun. And you said, well, Jenny, you're doing in a shade garden. How's that gonna work? We have through years of experimenting and putting it in various parts of the garden, this actually is a very shade tolerant plant. You will still get your blooms. Now, can you probably put it in the deep, deep shade with no sun? Probably not, but the amount of sun that it's gonna get in this garden, it will be um, just lovely and perfect. Now, I have two color blaze coleuses here. I have torchlight, right? So you have the color blaze torchlight, which has um, some veining in it of like a hot pink, deep purple, however you wanna look at it, and just a little bit of the lime green on the edge. I have that. And then I have, of course, um, I love this one, well, heck, I love them all. Uh, this is the Newly Noir. Now they're both gonna be nice size. I am only using one. I brought both because I was trying to figure out which one I like the best with the Rocapucos. And after looking at them and thinking about it, I'm only gonna use this in one of the containers. I think I'm gonna go with the, oh gosh, y'all. I don't know. 
I mean, you can't go wrong, really. But I think I'm going to go ahead and go with the Newly Noir, just in case this turns more hot pink and not purple. So I'm going to go with the Safe Choice and go with this one. I want a nice color contrast. So we're going to go with the Newly Noir and not the Torchlight. So we'll put this one off to the side. Now, I have Dichondra Silver Falls. I adore this plant because it is just a great... Huh, see, this is what happens, y'all. As Mary Claire says, they marry each other. So they're hooked up together. Um, they are one. And this is a beautiful accent plant that you can tell has a trailing habit. Again, I'm going to use this in the wall hanging because it really does not get much taller than this on your tag. Notice it says two to six inches. That is your height. So it is very low, but it will trail like two feet. We're gonna use this on the wall hanging, but it'll be with the Diamond Frost and the Rocapucos. So this will be my trailer in one container. And then we're going to use a new begonia. So we're gonna try out this new begonia. This is a Rex begonia. So very excited to try that out. We'll put these in two containers. Speaking of containers, where are we going to plant? If you are familiar with this garden, then you already know where we're going to plant. Uh, I had to go ahead and replace <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the liners in my hay racks. All of these containers, so we have one by the kitchen sink window, one here, and then one on the wall. This is the year that I had to replace my liners because I've had them for this is definitely the fourth year, possibly could be the fifth year that I have had them. All of them come from Kinsman Garden Company. They have a great selection of the kind of wrought iron, cocoa lined uh, containers and baskets. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, to go check them out. Like I said, this is year, at least year four, possibly year five with these liners um, that I had originally from the containers and I've just replaced them. Clearly we got a little stretching out to do right here, but that is the beautiful thing. One of the things that I probably the most number one thing that I love about Kinsman is the quality of their products. So when I bought these, I bought them all. Well, this one was the last one that I bought, um, but they came with the liner and y'all super great quality, very, very thick, very tough. When you have a cocoa liner that can sit outside um, in my garden for three years, three and a half years, and you don't have to replace it, then that is some good stuff. So these are the containers that we are going to plant up this morning. I think we should have enough time, um, but we're also going to go ahead and pot up the um, blue container that I have right here. So we're going to get some plants in this one as well. What I'm going to do is get the camera set up and we are going to plant these three, four containers here along the shade garden side of our house. Uh, it has rained for three days, so the dog is beyond out of her mind being happy to be outside. So you're not gonna see her probably sitting still very much today. She's gonna be running back and forth. But we're gonna get these planted um, and then we can get on with our day. All right, so I've got all my supplies set up right here. We are going to do this half circle planter again. This is where my kitchen sink is and we're going to put one newly noir right here in the center. Then I'm going to pack it full, y'all. Wedding, signature experience, tons of people. I am going, as I say, Disney planting, meaning very, very full uh, for me, at least. Anyway, uh, I've still got six weeks for this to fill out, so I am good. The Newly Noir, then we're going to do two Diamond Frost on either side of that, and then three of the Rocapucos, one, two, and three in there. Now, this is definitely the earliest that I have ever planted this this spot, which is a good thing because if you're a faithful follower of uh, <laughs> Gardening with Creekside, you know that right below me, I have two of the Aurelia Sun Kings, one on each side of this. I had no idea that these plants, uh, this beautiful perennial was going to love this spot as much as it does. Uh, they have just started to come back. I see just maybe two inches of growth down there. It's a beautiful, um, shade-loving, chartreuse-colored perennial that gets nice and tall. 
The reason I'm not putting any trailers on this is because these Sun Kings will get up at least to this tall. In fact, I'll probably have to come in here and randomly just very selectively snip them to keep them from completely covering it. So that's why there's not going to be any trailers right here. I just want a beautiful mounded habit right here that will be popping up out of the chartreuse. If you've been with me, you know that one of my secrets to a great container is that you take a really nice high quality compost like land and sea and you fill the bottom one third of your container. I do this with window boxes. I do this with hanging baskets. I do this with just a regular old pot. So the bottom third gets your land and sea compost. Whatever compost that you love, that's what you're going to put in here. Um, it's a windy day today. Then we're gonna go ahead and fill up the rest with a great potting soil. I personally love Proven Winners. It is the perfect balance for me in my garden of it holds the moisture and yet it drains well. Because we are so humid, we are so sticky, um, especially in the winter time, we are very wet. Spring is very wet. I need a soil that drains well. I don't need something that just is a sponge and holds onto the water because my plants don't like that and they will rot. So every time that I do a container, especially like this, meaning that this is going to be a quote, long-term planter for me, it is going to go, this is, you know, what, mid-April, and it's gonna go all the way through the fall. So that is a lot of growing season. I always fill up my containers with brand new soil, whether I am, um, you know, replacing the liner or not, that doesn't really matter. I always, always replace it with fresh soil. It makes a huge difference. So I've got my land and sea in the bottom, my potting soil on the top. Now we're gonna go in with fertilizers. We're going to use Proven Winners Time Release Fertilizer. Yes, the Proven Winners has some fertilizer in there a little bit more won't help now impatience are not very heavy feeders at all so your time release fertilizer is released by the temperature so the hotter it gets the more it releases when it's cold it does not release hence this is why I don't use it in the winter time so I just put a little bit in there um, that is ensuring me that maybe I don't have to do a lot of water soluble fertilizer in here at all coleus is not a heavy feeder the diamond frost is not a heavy feeder so by just giving that time release fertilizer i should be really kind of good to go a game changer for us last year was us using biotone with our annuals and um, the biotone of course is a great starter fertilizer and it develops nice strong healthy roots because as we say happy roots happy shoots so all i'm doing is just mixing this in here as such now this is going to be really simple y'all we're going to put the coleus in the dead center now <laughs> these coleuses the color blaze coleus they can get very large especially in the landscape um, i am a massive huge fan of these guys because they're so easy and so low maintenance so right away <laughs> The container's gonna look a little dinky. It's gonna look a little small. That's okay. I know what it's going to look like in a month, six weeks, uh, two months, three months from now. It is going to be massive and gorgeous. As gardeners, we look into the future of what is going to be, maybe not necessarily what you see right now. I'm gonna put two of the Diamond Frost and then three of the Impatience around it. All of my plants are planted. I have uh, two last little tips for you. One, if you're like me 
and you have a memory of a gnat, as my husband affectionately tells me, um, I go ahead and take my tags. So it's one tag per plant, right? So the coleus, the euphorbia, and the impatient. I take those, I put them together, and then I just kind of stuck them, stuck them, stick them, stick them in the back where they really can't be seen. But at the end of the season, or for some reason, I forget what these are then I have them in there and I know exactly what they are. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is I always come back and I top dress my containers with that compost. You can use compost, you can use mulch, you can use the um, aged pine bark vines. The idea is to come in and top dress these containers. Well, why do we, why do we do that? Well, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, it makes it, uh, makes it look nice because you don't see the perlite. You just see this nice uh, dark compost in here. So there's the aesthetics of it. Then there's also a lot of a good reasons horticulture to do it. One, it insulates the roots. So in it, your extreme temperatures, whether it's because you get have a cool, chilly night or if it's because you have a hot summer day, this helps kind of regulate the temperature in your containers. And then also it provides a whole another layer of nutrition, especially your, um, your compost. Your mulch, if you want to top dress with some mulch, it will break down and provide the nutrition. It helps retain water, so it doesn't, the moisture doesn't evaporate as quickly. That is one of the complaints about like a cocoa liner, um, container is that it dries out faster. It can. So that's why we want to keep that moisture in there. And then last but not least, it also helps with weed control. And you may think, well, weeds in a container? Yep, it can happen. Now, does it happen as much? No, not really. Um, but it definitely does. Now, this container is done. All I have to do is water. When I'm done with all of them, I'll come back and give it a, a good drink of water. But this container, I know based on, on how all of these plants grow, this is going to be really full. Gonna have the, the impatience will come and kind of kiss the top of this and kind of hang over a little bit like that. My coleus will get really tall and really full. <laughs> The great thing because uh, once these sun kings come up, I am not going to be able to get to this like this because these plants are huge. But my, you know, like I said, my window is right there. So I can literally open up the window and I can pinch back my coleus. Every once in a while, you're going to want to come in and pinch your coleus. That keeps it from being a tree and more of a nice rounded shrub type plant. So this is going to fill in quite nicely and be, be beautiful. Cannot wait. Now, Let's go to the very long hay rack in front of the big window. All right, my friends. Now, this is a challenging spot to film. It's a challenging spot to garden because I have got uh, beautiful plants around here. I have got my, um, my zebra hydrangea. I have got two massive bleeding hearts. I've got hostas. I've got ferns. I've got all sorts of things around here. So we're going to do a little bit of gardening yoga and our stretching and our moving. This is a very low hay rack, right? Because we have this nice big window into the kitchen. And as you can probably see, I have all my perennials coming up. We're gonna plant this in that same fashion of the one by the kitchen sink in the fact of we're gonna have mounting plants and not any trailing plants. If I had trailing plants, you're not going to see them. They are going to get tangled up in the, hosta, the hostas, the bleeding hearts, the hydrangea. So we're gonna keep it really, really simple and use mounding plants. This size, I don't know y'all, it's the biggest one. It's like 48 inches, somewhere around that, just give or take to kind of give you an idea. New liner that is really stiff, so we're gonna to have to kind of push it and, and move it. Once it gets the soil and the plants and the water in there, it will naturally then form into the shape of the hay rack. I'm not worried about that right now. It is a little stiff looking. I am going to plant it up the exact same way. Land and seed in the bottom, proven winter soil on the top, my time release fertilizer, my biotone, and then y'all, we are keeping this simple. Keep it simple, sweetie. It does not have to be complicated. You can make it complex and intricate with your plantings if you want to. I'm not going to. I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm simply going to use the Diamond Frost and I'm going to use the Rockapuco Purple Impatience and I'm going to alternate them. I'm going to do Impatient Frost, Impatient Frost all the way through. We'll see how far it goes because 
I want this to be nice and mounded and light and airy and mixing in with one another. Uh, and you can't tell where one plant begins and another one ends. So that's what we're going to do. Window box number two is now complete. Y'all, keeping it simple, it is going to be beautiful and elegant. Literally planted them in a straight line, alternated between the two plants. They're gonna get huge, they're gonna intermingle, they're gonna be stunning. Now, please keep in mind, again, I am planting for um, events. This is event planting and if this were um, if I were, wasn't hosting a wedding, if I wasn't hosting the signature experience then I probably would have used half of these plants. You plant for whatever it is that uh, the season of life that you're in or what is happening in your life and on your property and what is happening uh, just you know year by year, day by day, that kind of thing. So just keep in mind, you, you do not have to use this many plants. This is a lot of plants um, and they are going to be very snug and tight in there together. That is why I always start with that fresh soil, right? Because now that we've got that many plants in this container, then they have plenty of room for their roots to grow, lots of that great nutrition that they're gonna be very, very happy. And then I just have to basically just keep them watered. What we're gonna do now is turn to this guy right here, the wall hanging and get it planted up. Going to use a lot of those same elements, but we are going to switch it up a little bit using the begonia and the silver falls. This has always proven to be a very interesting uh, container to plant because it has the point on the bottom, so I can't like just put it down on the ground. Anyway, so I'm standing on my little stool and we're going to get this uh, planted up. Now we're going to do it the exact same way. Um, let me get some soil in and then we'll talk about the plants and the plant arrangement. Soil is in, compost is in, fertilizers are in. And then I have just uh, placed the plants in here to kind of give you an idea. I'm gonna do close-ups of everything when we're said and done. Uh, it's just easier to film it this way. Start in the back. We have a beautiful Rex begonia. This is going to be a part shade to shade plant that will get 15 to 18 inches tall and wide. So <laughs> the goal, the plan, the prayer is that it will get full it will come through the container and get tall and wide right so this is going to be my thriller in my container my fillers of course will be the Rocapuco purples i have two right here on each side again the idea is that they will intermingle with the begonia and then fill in each side right here and be nice pops of color and the silver falls of course now i probably could just do one but i mean go big or go home right i mean that seems to be the uh, theme of the day here so i'm putting two here in the front now remember only two to six inches tall in a container really that two inches and then we're going to have massive trailing gorgeous silver foliage that's going to blow in the breeze and be really really pretty that begonia that dark um, it has like a dark purple and some silver so that will really contrast nicely off of my gray walls and then that purple with the rockapucos we now have that in three different containers right so when you're approaching this way you're coming down the driveway you see that same consistent plant in all three containers 
And then, like I said, once my perennials really fill in, I'll know where my holes are that I can put in my, my flowering annuals. And then maybe I do use some more of the purples or maybe I use a different plant. But even if I don't use the Rocapuco purples in the landscape, by putting it in all three of these containers, it brings the whole space together and makes it this gorgeous, cohesive look. So I'm going to rinse and repeat, do the same thing, of course, and just get these guys planted and then uh, get everybody watered. And we'll come back here and we'll do like a little mini garden tour of this whole space. Today's project is complete. It feels wonderful to get it done. Let me show you up close and personal how all of these containers look, and then we'll do a really quick little brief uh, garden tour here in this space because, uh, oh my gosh, I love this garden in early spring because all the hostas, everything looks so fresh. It hasn't gone through the heat and humidity of a North Carolina summer, and it is uh, just gorgeous, and it's still growing. So let's go to the containers first, and then we'll come back through and do a little garden tour. I am going to share with you how I keep slugs and snails like out of my garden and keep them from eating my hostas because that definitely is a problem with our heat and humidity. I'm going to start first here. Uh, this is definitely still in the shade. Uh, here we go. So the cute little wall hanging right here. That Diconjure Silver Falls is already trailing over and blowing in the breeze. I'm going to do my best to show this to you. The two Rakapukos on each side, the beautiful uh, begonia, very interested to see how that performs this year. And uh, I'll share more information with you on that begonia throughout the season. And keep that up to date and keeping you um, in Informed on how everything goes, of course, we'll do many tours through here as the summer progresses. So there we go. This again should get nice and tall. That begonia, 15 to 18 inches, should really fill in this whole gap. And then of course the impatience fill in here and here. As I said, as gardeners, we have to uh, use our imagination. As far as knowing how many plants to put in there, you really just kind of have to, experience is gonna be your best teacher on that. So you just kind of have to play around with it and then definitely look at your plant tags. Your plant tags, especially with Proven Winners, that's one thing we absolutely love about Proven Winners is they have a great plant tags. And on the back of your annuals and any of your shrubs, your perennials, they will tell you what your spacing should be. On the annuals, they'll do minimum, maximum, <laughs> I just completely ignore the minimum spacing on this. Life is too short for minimum spacing, especially when you're hosting multiple events in throughout the summer. 
So you can kind of get an idea on that. Definitely in the landscape, if you want to spread everybody out, just kind of look at that and that'll give you an idea. Here we go on the low, long hay rack. Just simple, right? Simple, classic, beautiful, very happy. They are definitely touching each other even as of right now. But my vision is, is that they will completely fill this in and get nice and mounded. Probably the diamond frost, I would think by the end of the season, would be close to this um, first little pane of the window right here. So simple, but yet beautiful. And you can see how nice it looks having that land and sea compost as my top dressing. Of course, you saw everybody got a nice, good drink of water. Uh, welcome to North Carolina. We've had three days of rain. As you can see, it is a breezy day here. Nine o'clock in the morning. It's already, I don't know, 60 something degrees. Next week is going to be in the high 80s. Well, could hit 90 by next Thursday. Absolutely crazy town. Um, so here we go. You can still see this little guy is still dripping. Great time to talk about this. People have asked me multiple times about, do I need to put a spacer between the container and my wall? Will it rot the wall? Will it stain it? All of those kinds of questions, which are great valid questions. And I would say, this is where you need to be a student of your own garden and to understand like your house. Our siding is the hardy, hardy plank siding, hardy board, which is a cement product. It looks like wood, but it is a cement product. So it doesn't rot. Yes, we paint it, but we don't technically have to paint it like wood. Um, the color is classic French gray. People ask me all the time, classic French gray. I believe it's a Sherwin Williams. Um, so I don't have any problems with or concerns about it rotting my wood. I don't have any stains. The only place I would say I may have like a stain would be at the very bottom where it touches it. But before, like when I was cleaning everybody up before we started planting, I just took my gloved hand and wiped off the wall and it was all fine. But if you have a wood siding or if you have some sort of like a wood structure, then you might want to consider putting some sort of spacers between the container and your wall. Again, be a student of your own garden, your own house, and understand what you need to do in your space. Uh, yeah, again, very, very simple on this. That coleus right there, of course, is going to get nice and big. The euphorbias, the three begonias. Now, is everybody like perfectly spaced Probably not. I mean, this was a little tall, a little awkward to plant. Am I worried about that? Uh, nope. Are you gonna be able to tell that in about a month? Nope, because everybody's gonna be growing together and be very, very happy. Keep in mind, look right here. Here is one Sun King that is popping up. Now that they are popping up, they will absolutely jump. They will explode. And then the other one is just right there. They will get so big because um, none of this bed is on irrigation. It is simply, I have to hand water everything in here. But these two guys, literally y'all, will get way up here and they will probably crowd out the, um, this is the Jack of Diamonds Brunnera and, and then my Hellebore. So they're gonna get really big. I'll have to move my mushrooms and yeah, so they're gonna get big. Chartreuse color will be stunning. I forgot to, uh, I didn't, sh didn't show you this. I was at the wall hanging and I thought we were done. I was like, oh yeah, I gotta do this container. Kept it real simple. So again, I put one more of that Rex begonia back here in the back. This should get nice and full, that 15 to 18 inches tall and wide. And then I repeated the two silver falls so they will be really pretty trailing down this blue pot. Again, keeping it cohesive, repeating those same plants over and over. The Silver Falls will echo against my uh, pink Chablis Lamian. The Lamian is a perennial for us. We sell it as an annual, but it definitely is a perennial um, here in our Zone 8A garden. And this is called Pink Chablis because it does these really nice, soft baby doll pink flowers. All right, now let's just run through the, the bed really quickly here. Everybody, like I said, is coming up and growing and being quite nice and quite vigorous in their growth. We have, we have the Solomon seal, y'all. They are very happy plants, and you can see that it has started to come in to 
this uh, euchre. This is called Dale's Strain, the euchre. Jerry actually started this from seed, gosh, year, like 10, 12 years ago, if not longer. And such a great, great euchre. I have another one on the other side, but yeah, the, uh, the, the Solomon Seal is kind of coming in. But this is why we love Solomon Seal is look at those sweet, sweet little flowers. Is that not gorgeous? Of course, this is a spring bloomer. And then for the rest of the season, you just have this great variegated foliage. Now you can easily dig these up. You can easily move them. You can divide them. Um, optimally, you know, fall would be the perfect time to do it. Now would not probably be the optimal time. You certainly could do it, but this is just one of my absolute favorite spring perennials because of those sweet little blooms. We've got the ghost fern coming back quite nicely. So this is called a ghost fern because it is a cross between a Japanese painted and a lady fern. So it has the color of a Japanese painted, but it gets the height of a lady fern. Really fun. Okay, B, out. And then we have the uh, hydrangea from Southern Living. This is white wedding, a great panicle, filling in quite nicely. And then we just repeat, right? And then coming down, we actually have three of those euchras. There you go. And then we have two more of the ghost ferns, uh, white by the gate, doing just fine. She was a great bloomer. I probably need to come in here and go ahead and kind of like tack these back up. I'm training it to go along this trellis right here. And with your camellias, now's a great time to be fertilizing. Holly tone, you want lots of good growth throughout the summer. Keep it nice and well watered, especially those first couple of years when you're trying to get them established. So they get nice roots and give you gorgeous flowers. Hellebores, I mean, y'all, seriously, just huge. Now, this area again looks a little barren. We will see how that Sun King comes up. And then I have three, this is, three hostas right here along the edge. They are all the same hosta. Now you'll notice as we come, like this one is the smallest because this gets a little bit more sun than the other ones, so it is a little bit smaller. But this is Wiggles and Squiggles. Beautiful chartreuse, very um, frilly kind of long, narrow leaves on it. But when we get down to the other end, I'm gonna show you how big the last one is. And then as of course coming through, more, I love, I do not, I don't know if this is Pictum. I'd have to go back and look to remember what fern that is, but is that not gorgeous? That Japanese painted, oh! And then of course your hostas, right? The other wiggles and squiggles. We've got golden tiara right here, all sorts of them. Uh, Annette's holly fern. I call this Annette's holly fern because when we went to go visit our friends, David and Annette in Waco, Texas, uh, ooh, my gosh, that would have been five years ago now. Um, she had a gorgeous stand of holly ferns and I was like, hey, Annette, can I take some home? And she was like, of course. So I took a clump, put it in my garden. And so this is now affectionately uh, Annette's holly fern. She is gorgeous. She is happy. Uh, she is just continuing to grow and I absolutely adore her. Of course, this holly fern is a definite perennial and it is cold hardy. It is an evergreen. I did go ahead and take out the old foliage. So all you simply have to do is go in there and clean it up. I think you can see maybe there's a, there's an old one right here, but all of this is a beautiful new growth right in there. Poor little Autumn Frost Hosta might have to move her forward just a little bit. And then sweet Bashful Betty. I love Bashful Betty right here. These are my, <laughs> oh, my bleeding hearts, y'all. I mean, ginormous. You can see that they're getting kind of close to the end of their uh, bloom cycle. If we peek down in there, you can see those sweet classic bleeding heart blooms. This is one plant. So very, very happy right here. Your bleeding hearts, you may notice when it starts to really get really hot. So for me, um, July, definitely into August, probably just in July, it looks like your bleeding hearts are dying. They're not dying, they're going dormant. They love the cooler temperatures. So when the heat starts to hit, man, they're like, okay, it's hot, I'll see y'all in the spring, I'm done. At that point, when they look like they're dying and they're just starting to shrivel up, just go ahead and cut them to the ground. Just cut them to the ground. All that energy is in the roots. Clearly, they will grow and be quite happy. Do not worry about it, you're not killing it. Uh, just listen to the plant, it will tell you. So just think, 
kind of like a peony in certain areas. If it's not happy and it's too hot, and I say it's not happy because it's too hot, then they will just simply start to go dormant. It is okay. And then we have um, the, like I said, the zebra hydrangea right here. This is a macrophylla hydrangea in the fact that it will bloom on old growth. Now, it's called zebra because the new stem growth, if you can see right here, is nearly black. So all the new stems will be a really deep, deep, dark color. And then it has pure white flowers on it. So you could have the dark, dark stems and then the pure white classic hydrangea blooms on it. There you go, gets its name, uh, zebra hydrangea. This is Dre's Dagger. This is a fern that we sold several years ago. We haven't had it in stock, um, but this one loves its spot right here. It's really fun. It reminds me of Crested Surf in the fact that it has the little tassels on the end. Of course, Crested Surf has um, that Japanese painted colorish, coloration to it, where this is just a nice solid green, but this is Dre's Dagger, still unfurling, still getting nice and big. This, speaking of big, is the, the other Wiggles and Squiggles. So this is, they were planted all three at the exact same time. This gets more shade and probably a little bit more water because it is closer um, to the hose link right there. So anytime we're in here doing water, it'll kind of, you know, make its way to, to right here. So this Wiggles and Squiggles is unbelievable. I mean, it is every bit of two feet wide, um, if not bigger. And you can see how much bigger the leaves are on this one as opposed to the very first one I showed you. And then this little hosta was well, not little. This big hosta right here is also quite fun. This is called um, white feather because you will see that it's no, there's nothing wrong with it. It has a lot of white in it. And so as it is um, growing and developing, those new leaves are have a really kind of a white texture to them, white coloration. So yeah, so white feather was one that we had a couple, again, a couple of years ago. Don't have it in stock right now. Um, but if you see a white feather, grab it because it is a lot of fun. And then we have, you know, the euchras and everything. Also, there is one more bleeding heart right back there. But this is the garden. Now, how do I keep it nice and neat and clean? Well, you in the fall were with us, I think, when we were planting and we did a nice top dressing of land and sea. I really do that once a year. That acts as my mulch. It helps, you know, helps prevent weeds. Um, this can be a little bit challenging in the fact because in the fall when we reseed the grass, some of it inevitably ends up in the flower bed right on the edges. So I'm still pulling a little bit of the grass up on the edges. I just hand weed this, but once all the perennials really pop out, I don't have to worry about weeds too much because it's just all that good coverage. The main thing that I have to worry about here is the heat of the summer, making sure it's nice and well watered. Like I said, there's no irrigation on this bed whatsoever. It's a great thing about having the hose link right here is I can easily pull it out. I'll come out first thing in the morning, water everything, um, and really I'm watering my baskets and then just kind of shooting like my hydrangea, my camellia, and then everything else just kind of, you know, absorbs that water as I'm watering those plants. I don't specifically worry too much about my hostas because they are really well established. And like I said, when I'm watering the other high priority plants, they naturally will get water as well. Um, so watering, fertilizing, I have already gone through and done plant tone. So I've already plant toned, uh, holly toned, uh, rose toned. So everything has been fed. So we're good on that. Main thing that I have to worry again about this bed because it is shade and it can be a more moist area because I'm in here watering all the time would be like my snails and my slugs. Also, you could have like, um, yeah, so those are my two main things. Now, you have seen me use, especially like in the dahlia bed, we have seen me use um, a slug and snail bait before. This is one that we have now available online. I'm trying to show you to it. Um, this is called Sluggo Plus. A lot of different companies will make the snail and slug bait it is, you'll notice that it is OMRI listed, so it is organic. You can use it in your organic gardening. And what it does that, uh, so on here on the top, so I don't know if you can see it, I'll just read it to you. So it's called, it says, Insect, Slug, and Snail Pellets for Organic Gardening. It contains Spinosad, I'm probably butchering that, you'll be fine. Spin <clears throat> Spinosad is derived from a naturally occurring soil-dwelling bacterium, easy to use pellet formula, 
kills earwigs, cutworms, sow bugs, sow bugs, sow bugs, pill bugs, crickets, slugs, and snails for outdoor use around residential sites. So it is a shaker. You can take it off. You can, reminds me of like a Parmesan can. So you can do where you can pour it or it has the little sprinkles. So you can just come in here and you just sprinkle it around your plants. You will have to do this um, after it rains because the water will go ahead and, um, yeah. I like to do it every couple of weeks, especially after like a big rain, I will do it. But when my hostas are this beautiful, I do not want snail and slug damage where I get holes all in them because then once you've got the holes, it's really kind of hard to get rid of them. Um, so I use a lot of preventative treatment. I've done this for a couple of years and have great success with it. And I have great looking hostas. Now that I seem to have gotten them a little bit more under control, I don't have to do it as often. In the very first year, I was faithful and I did it like every week, two weeks. So if you have snails, slugs, uh, what else was it? Cut worms, earwigs, pill bugs. If you have those problems, you might want to use it. Um, it is available on the website or, you know, find snail and slug bait wherever you shop for your gardening needs. Uh, but it, yeah, it is listed for Omri Listed Organic Gardening. All right, y'all, it has been a great day. I feel very productive. It makes me very happy when I look out my kitchen windows, when we drive down, it all looks great. We'll see y'all in the next video. Bye, friends.